Well, good morning, guys. Thank you for coming again. This is an awesome opportunity to rejoice in the good work that God has done. So can we, can we welcome up Spencer? This is Spencer, everybody. And Spencer's going to tell us how God has uh, saved him from his sins and brought him into his kingdom. So go ahead, Spencer. Tell everyone how God has done that for you. Thanks. Um, so I started going to church, you know, just before middle school with my mother and sister. But at one summer camp, you know, I got you know, quote unquote saved, I dedicated my life to Christ and I didn't see any like peer pressure or anything from my friends because they had gone to an earlier service. So there wasn't like a hasty decision, like a youth camp uh, decision, like an emotional response. After returning home, I let my mother know I wanted to be baptized. But now as I look back on that time, there really was no evidence of that conversion because I didn't really understand the gospel that was being preached to me, I was just, you know, quote unquote, on fire for Jesus, as most kids are right after a summer camp. And so after getting baptized when I was younger, there really wasn't much evidence of this. I was still living in sin. I was being selfish, disobeying my parents, and later on, treating my wife and kids like inconveniences, all while claiming to be a Christian, um, attending church, and even serving on church leadership. I never read my Bible outside of church or um, any related groups, partly because I didn't understand it. Or I didn't even want to try. Where should I start reading? What, what if I don't understand what's being shown to me without someone explaining it? What if there's some hidden cryptic meaning I'll never understand without someone having to explain it to me? Or I, I saw it as if I wasn't going to be successful at it, I didn't even try. And this was problematic because a, a true Christian th hungers and thirsts for God's knowledge to want to get to know him better. So after some time while still attending church, uh, there was an evangelical controversy that pushed me to start developing discernment, which is sort of telling the difference between right and almost right in terms of biblical teaching. And I knew the basics of the gospel, you know, Jesus died for your sins. But looking back, I just, I didn't put my trust in that gospel for salvation. And I would listen to Christian podcasts calling out false teachers, and I would learn things about the Bible, but just to puff up my head with knowledge so I could call out those same false teachers. But this didn't last long because um, soon after that controversy, I was reading Ephesians 5, trying to callously get my wife to submit to me. But what I found was that I wasn't submitting to Christ. Mm. And as a husband, I was being called in Ephesians 5.25 to love my wife as Christ loved the church. Well, what does that really mean? He gave himself up for her. And to quote uh, John MacArthur, um, he gave, uh, no, true love is always concerned with and seeks to the purity of its object. But I wasn't clearly living up to this. I was so convicted that after uh, writing my notes in my Bible, I put my pen down, I walked over to my wife, I got on my knees and apologized. Mm. I said, I'm sorry, I haven't been loving you the way Christ loved his church. I haven't been cherishing you, loving you, seeking your needs above my own. I've treated you with bitterness, keeping score to benefit myself. And that ends right now. I wanted to be the husband and father God had called me to be. And so it was at that moment I began to realize that maybe I wasn't a real Christian uh, because a Christian husband wouldn't treat his wife that way. About a year later, Lisa and I started studying with my cousin Kristen and her husband Nick. And while studying Philippians, I came to chapter 2, 5 through 8. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As I touched my pen to paper, I started choking up with tears, because Jesus gave up all the honor and privileges of his deity that was rightfully his, and he could never be disqualified from, to be humbled and obedient to the point of death. And so how could I be reading this, write it down, and still be selfish in my fleshly desires like sleep, being inconvenienced, playing drums, my pride, my ego, and just the weight of the sin against God destroyed me. And I remembered 2 Corinthians 5.21 for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him 
we might become the righteousness of God. And in that moment, I knew that God had cleared all my sin charges against me because Jesus had paid that penalty and suffered on the cross. And all I could do in response is bow the knee and acknowledge that Christ is Lord of my life and I will be obedient to him. I finally understood what salvation truly is, not just the facts of the gospel, but believing in it by faith. And since then, my life has radically changed. Before Christ, I was a selfish and prideful husband, but now I desire to cherish my wife and love her without trying to keep score. And you can ask her about it, you know, comparing Spencer from two years ago to now, and she'll tell you. (laughs) I used to steer away from reading the Bible, but now that's all I want to do. I have the desire to know and seek God through his word and sort of become a little bit of a Bible nerd. I used to be distant from my children, but now I desire to teach them about God as a spiritual leader of my home. I know I couldn't have done any of these things on my own, but it's by God's grace alone that I have come to know and be made right with him by believing through faith that Jesus has died for my sins and rose again to conquer the spiritual death I should have deserved. Praise God. Yeah, just an incredible testimony of God's grace where you realize when you experience the weightiness of your sin against a God who takes it personally, who has created you for his glory, and you were living for yourself, as Spencer said, and now you want to live for God. The kindness and the patience, as it says, that leads people to repentance. Spencer, you, you experienced that, and you rightly said, now I've put my faith and trust in that. I, I devote my life to that, and so now we're going to baptize you based on that confession. So it is my privilege, uh, based off of that confession, to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All right, we can uh, welcome up Nick Robles. Can we give him a round of applause? Go ahead and tell us how God has saved you by his grace. I grew up going to church. As long as I can remember, I believed in God and Jesus, and I would call myself a Christian. But my understanding of any of that was incomplete, to say the least. In my youth groups, I was taught that to become a Christian, you simply had to say a prayer and invite Jesus into your heart. I did that, but never understood why, and I had no real ownership of my faith. I never felt the weight of my sin, and the only times I can even remember feeling deep guilt is if something I did hurt someone or broke uh, some kind of rule. I saw forgiveness and grace from God as being just an easy prayer of recommitment away. Grace was cheap to me, and I had such a low view of God. In my late 20s, I began to take my faith more seriously, but purely out of self-interest. I started to read my Bible on my own, and even reading it from Genesis to Revelation in 2019. But my wife Kristen and I were not in a biblical church, My own lack of knowledge, my personal selfishness, and being under man-centered teaching led me to view God's word through a self-help success guide lens. Without realizing it, I became wrapped up in listening to a host of culturally relevant pastors who fit right in line with what I wanted to hear from God. Though they they told me I was enough, I could have faith that will lead me to success and ease, and if I believe strongly enough, God will solve all my problems. At the same time, Kristen and I had just moved to Irvine, and we entered into one of the hardest years of our lives. Our family relationships completely crumbled on both sides, and we had hurts and conflicts that we could never have anticipated. We struggled to find a church and felt really isolated while trying out so many that didn't feel right. I was wrestling so much with what was happening, and I felt like no matter how hard I tried to repair things, it would only get messier and more broken. By the grace of God and in his perfect timing, he used my bride to to begin to show me truths that would completely open my eyes to how desperately in need of real salvation I was. Kristen and I went on an anniversary trip to Kauai in January of 2020. She had listened to an episode of a podcast where a man named Jeff Durbin humbly dismantled the teaching of my favorite motivational speaker, pastor. She told me I really should listen, and this was on the flight heading out for our first real vacation in years. (laughs) I was hesitant to say the least and brushed it off, but I eventually listened, and the conviction of valuing his teaching so much hit me hard. Kristen also found the American Gospel documentaries and again brought it up as something I absolutely had to take in, and I heard a complete Gospel presentation for the first time. 
The God of the Bible created the world. Man sinned against him and became separated from God. Jesus died on the cross to bring those who repent and believe in him back into union with God. But what I heard personally was Christ died for me. My sin put him on that cross. With what I deserve, I could have nothing but God alone and have absolutely everything. The Bible is not a moral guide. It is about a God who is perfect, holy, just, and righteous, redeeming his people in the ultimate expression of love, grace, and mercy. From this point forward, God moved fast in completely changing my heart of stone. He humbled me before him. I understood nothing, that nothing I could do would earn me favor in God's eyes and would lead to an easy life. I became insatiably hungry for God's word, and knowing I had so much to learn, I tried to just stand under a waterfall of faithful biblical teaching each day. He opened my eyes to how inadequately I was leading my wife spiritually, and he gave me a desire to completely lean on him in fulfilling my role as a husband. I wanted desperately to do this better, and I knew getting us to a solid church was of highest importance. The Sunday after we returned from Kauai, we came to Compass Bible Church Tustin and heard Pastor Elliot preach from the Psalms and talk about God in a way that completely elevated him to where he should be as a perfect, holy, glorious, beyond all comparison God. We met Kurt and Candace Colmack at the uh, Connect table that day, and we were so blessed by the genuine hospitality, fellowship, and love that they would show us, along with so many others at Compass, over the following months. God also gifted us deep in relationships with old friends, and we dove headfirst into studies that led, led to major growth with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, they're here today, Josh, Jackie, Kyle, Sophia, Josh, and Christine. Where we lacked, God provided and gave us a real <clears throat> family in the church body. Reflecting, I am grateful to have a biblical worldview that gives me true meaning and context for the ways God has moved in my life. I can look back and see God giving me challenges that would serve to show me how truly sufficient he is, no matter the outcome of the trial. When I was younger, I had cancer. I went through chemotherapy and radiation and came through healthy. Glory to God, and he was enough. We have experienced the pain of broken relationships that remain that way now. Glory to God, and he is still enough. Through it all, Christ will always be enough for me, and anyone who turns from this world to him and him alone. Amen. Amen. Yeah, something Nick said really struck a chord with me. I mean, all of it when you hear it, but he said grace was cheap to him at some point. And when the grace of God is cheap to you, you don't understand his magnitude and your insufficiencies, which is what Nick was saying. And to be wrecked by that and to have God come in and to completely restore and redeem and adopt and bring in brings that confidence of a new life. So we're confident of Nick's testimony and his profession of faith, his belief that Christ has saved him in his work alone. Um, and so Nick, based on that profession of faith, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, we got one more. Max, you want to come on up here? Here we go. Everyone, this is Max, and he's going to tell us how God has uh, brought him into his kingdom. Go ahead, Max. Ooh, catch my breath here a minute. This water's not warm. <laughs> I kept mine kind of short, uh, two reasons. One is I talk a lot, and two, there is another service after this one. So I was trying to figure out where to start. At 16, I thought I gave my life to God. But looking back, like Jesus said in Matthew 7, I had no firm foundation to stand on and no one really to teach me how to establish one. Now looking back, I realize just how sandy that foundation was. Last year, I was talking with Pastor Elliot about my relationship with my wife. My sinful thoughts took me down a selfish road, thinking that people will always let me down because of my past experiences, and I took that out on my wife. With those sinful thoughts, I told Pastor Elliot that I had one foot in my marriage and one foot out, expecting things to change and go for the worse. Needless to say, that kind of mindset put me on a path 
of major sin, and it almost cost me my marriage. That was my choice, not hers. And praise God for her obedience, her de determination to honor God, her patience, and her prayers. P.E. raised that same question to me about my relationship with God, about having one foot in and one foot out. That question really blew me away. It never crossed my mind that my whole life, my whole walk, was just half-hearted. Looking back, I could see the, the hard truth and the reality of where I was, neither hot nor cold. And the scripture in the second chapter of Revelations came to mind. Because you're neither hot nor cold, I spew you out of my mouth. That was a hard truth I needed to accept, and I really needed to make a choice. I can either be all in or die in my sins. But in 2 Peter in chapter 3, he says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patience toward you and wishing that all that any should perish, or no, not, not any should perish. Apparently I had uh, <laughs> missed a word. But that all should reach repentance. For one, I am extremely grateful for God's patience and mercy. So I responded to Jesus' call of denying myself and taking up my cross and following him. Through this, God restored my marriage and made it better. Gave me a renewed love for his word and fellowship and help me put to death the selfish desires of my flesh. Praise God. Yeah, Max's poignant phrase that he thought was one foot in and one foot out, that's not how God wants it. He wants your whole heart, all heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so that's what repentance is. It's counting the cost. It's turning from this life to give your life to God. And when you're ready to do that, you realize that God's accepting free grace is there for you. Uh, the, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and he uh, has brought you into the kingdom. So Max, based off that profession of faith, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, everyone, we're excited to rejoice in God's good work in saving people. And this is Brittany. Can we welcome Brittany here? Yeah. Whoa. There we go. Maybe you and I have a different definition of welcome, somebody. <laughs> but thank you so much. Brittany, why don't you tell us what God has done in your life? All right. I grew up Catholic, very loosely knowing who God was and what Jesus did on the cross. I don't remember a time where I didn't believe that Jesus was God and that he had died on the cross for my sins. I didn't know the Bible well, and because of that, I justified my sin because I thought, or because I would compare myself to others, thinking that on average, I was a pretty good person. Though I always felt I had a relationship with God, it didn't become apparent until college that something about my faith was missing. My sophomore year, I signed up for a class on religion. We were challenged each week to address different topics, and we attempted to prove our thoughts correct based on our religion or worldview. It was then that I realized I didn't actually know a lot of what I claimed to believe. I started researching every major religion and started reading different arguments for and against God. This was just the start of me learning about who God was. My sophomore year of college, I also started dating someone who would be my boyfriend of three years. In all worldly aspects, this was a perfect relationship. In some ways, this relationship was more important to me than God himself, even though I wouldn't have admitted it at the time. This boyfriend was agnostic, and even more specifically, very critical of Christianity. This was the only tangible problem in our relationship, and that led me to even more debates about religion and what, the truth, and what truth there was behind it. The next three years of my life were aligned with sin. I lived for what made myself and the people around me happy, which resulted in sexual immorality, drunkenness, and depression. At the end of college, I started to feel more and more guilty for the life that I was living, knowing it was completely different than the life that I had imagined for myself. Having learned more about who God was, I started to feel so far away from what the Bible said about who a true believer is. I was living for the world and not living for my eternity. Mark 8, er, Mark 8 36 so well describes the foolishness in the way I was living. 
It says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? I knew that if I wanted to pursue God, I was going to have to leave my old life behind me and start a new life with God at the center. In 1 John 2, it says, whoever says I know God, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. So a little over three years ago, one step at a time, I broke up with my boyfriend, left the party scene, joined a Bible study, and gave my life to Christ, not knowing if I would ever find someone I loved as much, but willing to give it all up for God. While it was difficult to make that choice, it was the best choice of my life. God has completely changed my heart and my desires. My heart of pain, anxiety, and depression was changed into a heart of faith, hope, and trust in God. God even graciously gave me a godly husband who I could not have fathomed loving so much. I am so incredibly thankful for God's saving grace to everyone who believes in him and turns from their sins because it has changed my life. Praise God. And I, I hope you caught what she said there. There's, there's a lot of profound things in there. One thing she said, I was able to kind of compare my life to somebody else and I'm, I'm not that bad compared to them. And a lot of people can trick themselves that way for a long time. But it's not about the horizontal comparison, it's the vertical one. When David looks and he says, against you, God, you alone have I sinned. When we realize the offense, the personal offense to a holy God, that's when we feel the weightiness of our sin. And so we praise God that he's done that in Brittany's life and that she's put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So based off of your profession of faith, Brittany, it is my privilege to baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, guys, if you were that crazy for one of them, you got to be that crazy for all of them. This is Hannah, okay? Hannah, get on up here. Let's go crazy for Hannah. There we go. Oh, you guys have no idea how cold this is. Okay. All right. So I grew up in the church, and I attended church for as long as I can remember. My parents attended a Korean church close by in Irvine, and like most first-generation Koreans who had immigrated to America, they were looking for community, a place where their culture was accepted and celebrated, and they found that at church. I remember hearing the gospel at a young age, maybe early elementary at church. A Sunday school teacher used a wordless color track to teach me about salvation. All I had to do was to accept Jesus into my heart, and I would go to heaven. I'm pretty sure I accepted all that they taught me because who doesn't want to go to heaven? As I grew up in the church, all my closest and best friends were church friends. I don't even remember my school friends much. We went to lunch together after church, to all the church events together, and to church camps every year. I dis distinctly remember sitting in front of a bonfire at the age of eight in the middle of prayer time, and I got up to accept Christ into my heart. At that time, I knew, or thought I knew, what the gospel was. I knew the facts, I had them memorized, I could recite John 3, 16 easily to you. I was a good kid. I didn't really get into trouble, I was obedient to my parents, my teachers, anyone of authority. I was pretty quiet, passive, and timid, and rarely fought or argued with anyone. I did my homework, prayed for my dinner, ate all my food, put, put away my plates and my thank yous. And in high school, I was even serving in my church, helping out in kidsmen, participating in small groups, trying to grow in the Lord, which really just meant doing whatever my leader told me to do. I never studied or tried to understand the Bible. I was just going through the motions, all the while deceiving myself that that was enough. That was working out my salvation. I even got baptized in high school because that was enough. That, I mean, sorry, because that was the next thing to check off my list. I don't even remember what was said or, e or if I even said anything, but my friends were doing it and so I was too. However, I was not a new creation because I indulged in sin. I took advantage of his grace. I thought, well, I accepted Christ and he forgives me, so I just have to seek forgiveness after I will fully sin. When I accepted this false doctrine as true, this is when I started making stuff up based on what I thought I knew. I was making up my own God, my own version of Christianity that didn't condemn my sins. I cherry-picked what made sense to me. 
Basically, I was following my heart, which we know is deceitful above all things and desperately sick from Jeremiah 17. But of course, I didn't know that. I started living a rebellious life towards the end of high school and living for myself for years after. I stopped going to church because I thought, I know who God is. I have my own relationship with him. He knows my thoughts and my heart. I don't need to read the Bible or go to church. I just need to ask for forgiveness. Did I have regret over my sins? Yes, because I, know, I knew what morally sinful behavior was, but I wasn't repentant. I felt bad, but I didn't change. I confused regret with repentance, and I continued to deceive myself so that I could live in sin. I wanted Christ as my Savior, but not as Lord of my life. So when I moved away from Irvine, I lived with my sister who was in Berkeley at the time, and she was attending a solid Bible teaching church. She encouraged me for a year to go to church with her and was undoubtedly saving, uh, praying for my salvation, unbeknownst to me. <laughs> I refused, of course, because my made-up God, a.k.a. my deceitful heart, told me that we're good. You don't need church or even need to read the Bible. All you, all, you got all you need from years of attending church. I had eyes that did not see, and I had ears that did not hear. But slowly, and I really can't say it was anything, but the true God working in my heart, my heart was stirring. I wanted community, heard worship songs that were pricking my heart, and the way that my sister was living her life was encouraging to me. I was being drawn to what I was pridefully saying no to for years. So I said, yes, I will will attend church with you. And it was so different. I had never heard expository preaching before. And studying verse by verse, the historical context, the grammatical context, bringing in the Old Testament, I had thought the Old Testament was sort of irrelevant outside of the Adam and Eve, Noah's Ark, Moses type of children's Bible stories. But in order to understand the gravity of the New Testament, you had to know the old. It all tied in together. God had a plan to save his people, and that included me. It was mind-blowing and eye-opening. I don't know exactly when God saved me. It was not a particular moment. It was that year, with the constant unveiling and unblinding of my eyes with every exposited sermon and Bible study. It was understanding his word and comparing it to the way I was living and thinking that exposed my depravity. Romans 6, 1-2 says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Verses like that were a punch to the face. He was showing me who he was, the one true God, through his word. He was crushing the God that I thought was the God of the Bible. How could I go on willfully sinning if I am saying I am crucified with Christ? Matthew 7, 21 to 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. God was showing me that good morality wasn't it. Not even the works I would say that I did in his name. I needed a relationship with him. I needed to know him. And I could only do that by knowing and loving the God of the Bible. And through his word, he revealed to me what his grace and mercy was, what he was saving me from, and why I needed to be saved. He was bringing me into Christ to become a new creation, just like what 2 Corinthians 5.17 said. And now that I know and received his free gift of eternal life, I now strive to live a life of repentance, not regret, a life of grateful, loving obedience, not blind obligation. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am thankful for the new life he has given me through the pouring of his blood to live out my earthly days knowing him more, to glorify him in all that I do and say, and I eagerly await my heavenly days when he declares to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Mm, Awesome. Praise God for that. Yeah, listen to that statement, and if you don't know Jesus Christ right now as your personal Savior, she was trying to make a God of her own doing, and that's what we all do. That's what, uh, if uh, Psalm chapter 50, you thought that I was just like you. We try to make God like us, and that makes it easier for us, but God is who he is, and we have to respond to him and his revelation that he's given to us in his word, 
And I love that she made the contrast between repentance and regret. 2 Corinthians 7 says, there is worldly sorrow that leads to death, but there is godly sorrow that leads to repentance. And that's what we've seen in Hannah's life. So it's a joy to know Hannah. It's a joy to see this testimony and know that it's true. And based on that profession of faith, Hannah, I now have the privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, and we have uh, one more testimony of God's saving grace. This is Alfreda. Let's welcome Alfreda. Hi. Um, I grew up in the church, and therefore I thought I was Christian. I heard the gospel and I believed it. I, I even got baptized. I thought that was, I thought that was the right response. Um, to add to that, I was living a good moral life by this world standard. I obeyed most of the commands of the scripture and tried to do good when I can and when it's convenient. So I thought I was a good Christian because of that. I wasn't deliberately sinning against God. I lived this way for so long, I believe, I actually believed that I was a Christian. Um, even though my motivation were selfish. In a blink of an eye, lifetime passed. I graduated, got a job, got married, and got married. Last year, we lost the baby uh, in the womb. Um, through this experience, God softened my heart and as started to make me think about eternal things. Peter, my small group leader, and Pastor Elliot reached out to me and challenged my worldview, my understanding of the gospel, and what it means to be a Christian. Um, with their encouragement and God's grace, I realized that I, I never responded to the gospel in remit, repentance of my sin and faith in Jesus. I asked God to forgive me for my sin, and I put my trust in Jesus for my salvation. I used that heartbreaking experience Oh, sorry. God used that heartbreaking experience to ultimately lead me to genuine salvation. God had enlightened the eyes of my heart, um, as um, Ephesians 1.18, and the Holy Spirit exposed my sin now and has helped, to over, uh, has helped me overcome sin one by one. God also changed my heart for the church community, activities, fellowship, and and I, there's a desire to grow and learn more about who God is. Now I desire to spend time with God through prayer and reading the Bible and going through partners and understanding what it means to be his disciples. Uh, I can see how Philippians 2, 12 has become a reality in my life to work out my salvation, work out, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to both will to both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And I understand what, what it means to have joined the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Alfredo. Yeah, the heart-wrenching loss of losing a baby, I mean, you know the pain that that brings. And yet now we understand when we consider things like Romans 8, 28, that says all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, something so painful drew something out in Alfredo's heart that he didn't really respond rightly to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He had one foot in, one foot out. He wanted to do what he wanted to do on his own terms. And God's not in the business of doing that. And so praise God that that hurt drew you to him, Alfredo, and you repented and put your faith in Jesus Christ. And based off of that uh, profession of faith, it is my privilege now to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, we want to praise God for these awesome testimonies. And what these testimonies should do is cause you to reflect on the amazing work that God has done in your life. Your story is just as powerful because it's the story of God's work, not you. And when you consider that, use that 
for every advantage, in every way leverage it for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to believe that that's what God wants you to do as a Christian so you won't invest in the wrong things of this world, but you invest in the truly things that are worth the eternal things that God has called us for. So what we get to do right now is respond in praise. So we'll call the band up and they're gonna, they're gonna play us out with one song. We'll get to sing and uh, lift our hearts to God. I'm gonna pray while they get set and then we can uh, say uh, how encouraged we are by these people. Go talk to them afterwards. Tell them you're praying for them. God, we praise you for your goodness to us. Thank you so much for a wonderful day. God, whether we are in a building which we're looking for, Father, or in a parking lot, it doesn't stop your work. The gospel is never stopped, Father. Please, I ask that these testimonies would create in us a hunger to see the gospel advance. If Paul can sit in a prison cell and say, my circumstances has caused me to advance the gospel, I pray that this is a testimony of that. Our circumstances have caused us to use this to advance the gospel. So may that always be true of our church, every person who comes here, Father, to not be one foot in, one foot out, but to give their life to you. What would it profit a man if we lived for the things of this world and forfeited our soul? But you, God, have saved us by your grace. May we rejoice in that as we sing. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen.